welcome to my talk. Um, thanks for waiting. And uh, my talk is called The Complete Yarn Workflow. And today I'm going to be talking to you about how to best use your package manager to help speed up your development. So before we get started, a little bit about me. I work on the front end platform team at Eventbrite. And our goal as a team is to help other front end developers move faster through developer experience tooling, infrastructure improvements. And we also work on a shared React component library, also known as the Eventbrite design system. Of course, we're hiring, so please feel free to come talk to me afterwards if you're interested. It's a bit far from here in San Francisco, but on the plus side, it's definitely warmer. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, and um, as Christoph mentioned, I'm a very happy contributor to the Yarn project. So in the spirit of celebrating open source, I'll be talking about some of the features I wrote, as well as many other wonderful contributions from the larger community. Um, and I'll share the slides out later, so you have links to those PRs. Anyways, uh, so that's me, and that's a photo of me uh, three weeks ago in Thailand next to a baby elephant. And just like this talk, some effort has went into that photo behind the scenes. So that's also me being absolutely terrified of feeding the elephant. So I'm just saying that like the most of you developers out there, I'm just trying to keep it together most of the time. Uh, and if contributing to open source or giving a talk is something you want to do, I'd say go for it because it might be less scary than feeding elephants. So anyways, now you might be asking, I'm just here for skiing. Why should I care about this talk? Well, because a package manager is your bay. And if you're a terrible millennial and you don't know what that means, it stands for before anyone else. All the cool kids use it. Um, and it comes before anything else in our case, because nowadays you start your projects with a package manager. You probably have used the command like yarn start or npm install, um, because we can't write all the code, right? So we need node modules. And if you don't have those, you can't build an app. If you don't ha um, and we can't release things. And if you can't do those things, how are you going to get paid enough to go skiing, right? So full circle. Um, I also believe that learning more about the tool you're working closely with can only help you. And just like a true bay, it's always there for you, installing and safely keeping your node modules, running your run scripts, and doing much more in the background while you're at work. So the first step is choosing your package manager. And by package manager, I'm referring to the client tool, not the registry. And because we're a JavaScript community, we can't just have one thing of anything, right? That'd be too easy. Um, so some of these names might be familiar to you. But when we were deciding at my company, it really only came down to two options because half of those th things didn't exist yet. And Bauer being the oldest now officially recommends switching to Yarn. So big reveal. Um, at Eventbrite, we went with Yarn. Um, but we did have a thought process behind it, our main concern being that we wanted deterministic installs between developers and between environments. So that was our number one priority. And NPM shrink wrap just didn't cut it for us. Um, it was pretty unwieldy to maintain. And we also wanted the project to be based off community-driven efforts, because we saw a lot of packages going unmaintained over time. So we looked at things like the documentation website, how many GitHub stars the project was getting, and even how the issues were being maintained. Um, third, we wanted one tool that could solve a lot of our problems so that we only had to maintain and teach just one of them to the rest of the company. Um, and this included non-front-end people like our lovely ops team. So we wanted it to be easy to use. And finally, um, speed was on the list, but it wasn't the top most priority. But on that note, we did have some benchmark results when Yarn 1.0 was released just a few months ago. Um, so during our migration stage, we were actually on NPM 2 at the time, which didn't have any caching and just took forever for a lot of the developers. But between NPM N3 and Yarn 0 0.27, even then, Yarn was about five times faster with caching enabled. And with Yarn 1.0 on node 8, this was cut down to six seconds for around 1,300 de dependencies um, with warm cache. So that really blew us away. And, um, and also, as a side note, NPM 5 has made really significant improvements since then. And although Yarn still maintains an edge, it really bridged the gap pretty closely. So that brings us back to step two. Now, once you've sifted through the package managers and decided to go with one of them, um, it's time to actually configure your project um, with, a, uh, with the init command. And this step is the same whether you decide to go with Yarn or NPM or something else. First, you decide whether you're writing a library or an app. 
And if you don't know, just ask yourself, is another developer going to be using your code? And if that answer is yes, then you should consider these things. First field is version. And it's important that as your package is evolving, you follow strict semver. And this might sound obvious at first, but things like incorrect pre-release or alpha tags could mean that your users could get the wrong package when they expect to get the latest one. Um, second field is dependencies, which are installed transitively. And this simply means that dependencies of your dependencies become your dependencies. Or to put it in reverse, every time you add a new one, all the other libraries using your library and the parent libraries that use that library will have a new dependency. Um, so try to keep the module small. That's like a general good rule of thumb. And if you do need to include it, be flexible, um, minor range being the standard, so that people can upgrade to new patches if they become available. Um, next is peer dependencies, which are generally useful for if you're writing something like an ESLint plugin or a React add-on, and you don't necessarily want to include React and ESLint to go along with it. Um, but the same general rule follows. Um, be flexible, and um, it could get annoying pretty quickly because the, the client tool will warn you if they're not met. Um, so be considerate of your users. Um, and finally, dev dependencies. I say jokingly only if you care about the developers on the project, because unlike hard dependencies, they're not installed transitively um, and will only install when you're inside of that project directory. Some honorable mentions include the main field, have one. This is an entry point to your library. Um, same with license. And if your library has an uh, executable binary like a uh, client tool, um, then you could enter a path to that using the bin field, and it'll automatically be linked once you run um, yarn install. And um, along the lines of keeping your module small, use an npm ignore file. And uh, finally, you have the published configurations if you want to uh, publish to your own registry. Um, otherwise, if you're not building a library, you're most likely building an app, which is actually much simpler. Um, the only thing to note is that um, you set the private field to true in package.json, and then um, the NPM registry will actually prevent it from being published. Um, nowadays, with Webpack and other build tools, you're usually deploying a bundle, so there aren't too many reasons to keep dependencies in production. So at Eventbrite, for example, our main app package.json just has that private field set to true, and everything else set as dev dependencies. So we're finally ready to install our dependencies um, once your package.json is ready to go. Um, so you just type in yarn, because that's the default command for install. And um, once you first run yarn, it'll generate a lock file. And the subsequent times you run Yarn, it'll check for changes in package.json and sync between those two and update and rewrite the lock file um, if it has to. And the nice thing is that it'll also auto-merge your Git conflicts as well if um, that happens to be the case. Well, that was easy, right? But under the hood, a lot of things are going on. Um, Yarn's asking questions like, what configuration files should I use? And it'll recursively search through your um, computer and look to look for RC files. Um, and then it'll look for cache for um, all of your dependencies. And you might have different places where you store the cache. It could be the default cache. And maybe you have an offline mirror, or you um, specified another directory with a flag. Um, and for security, it'll also check against the hash if, you're lock file, if you already have a lock file and make sure that the dependency you're getting matches what's, in, what's on the lock file. And if all of these checks don't match, then only then it'll perform a non-blocking request to the network. And this is one of the reasons why Yarn was really fast in the first place compared to NPM. It's that caching was enabled. And when it did make fetch requests, um, it did so um, in parallel. Um, so once you have the packages all ready, it'll link the packages that have been deduped and run any installation or build scripts, and then finally warn you if, you if your modules don't meet your requirements or are incompatible with your OS, for example. But these are all implementation details that you don't really need to worry about um, until you do. <laughs> so 90% of the people are covered by this point. But if you're working on a large team with hundreds of developers, um, then you run into some hairy issues, as it often happens when you scale. So for us, um, we ran into this very meta pro problem of using Yarn itself deterministically across the team. Um, 
So here are some things that help us out. Um, first thing is have your team stick to either Yarn or NPM 5. Um, you know, just by communicating it through documentation or custom scripts, Docker, et cetera, so that either the lock file or package lock JSON always gets updated simultaneously. I know they're supposed to be compatible across the tools, but it just leaves less margin of error, and just trust me on this. Um, and if you want to go a step further and lock down the version of Yarn that you're using, Yarn has like a cool feature where you could save the path of the Yarn binary to in the Yarn RC file. Um, and then you commit the binary in the repo. So everyone who downloads that package will use that particular version of Yarn every time they run it. Um, for us at Eventbrite, Docker kind of solves this problem for us. Um, we use it in development, so it pins the version of Yarn. But those that have uh, worked with Docker, um, it comes with its own sort of strengths slash um, issues that you might run into. So one of its strengths is the build cache layer, right? So and until um, the recent version of Docker, we had to invalidate the hashed contents of our own um, package JSON and lock file to make sure that Docker wasn't using the old build cache. Um, so we did that manually by checking the MD5 sum. Um, yeah, and then the other tricky thing was finding out how to let the cache persist through the installs, since volumes, which is like Docker way of um, persisting um, uh, files throughout um, um, through containers, is that they're not available during build time. So we tried several approaches, like Git cloning tarballs, running Yarn twice, first with the cache layer, and then rerunning for just the change dependencies. We also tried um, having this parent container where our um, container was inheriting from. And then we also tried saving um, the cache to a local git ignore directory. So just keep that in mind. You would have to figure out how you want to incorporate Yarn into your existing tool. Um, and that's um, and I'm happy to talk to you more about it if you're interested. So since we discussed a bit of Yarn RC, um, let's jump to step four. So Yarn will work out of the box in most cases without any configurations set up. But if you want to, there are plenty of options to choose from. And I'd say that there are three levels of persistence when it comes to configurations. First step is flags. You probably used this before, which are, which are simply arguments being passed with each instance you run Yarn. So in the first, first example, we're passing in where to, uh, where to get the cache from um, by specifying the, specifying the cache folder. Um, the second level of persistence is the yarn uh, config command. So you say yarn config set um, save prefix, um, which will prefix uh, all of your versions to the patch um, version, um, sorry, the patch range. And um, this saves to your local yarn RC, and it'll apply every time you run yarn locally. And yarn RC can also be edited manually, which brings me to the next point. Um, you could actually commit the Yarn RC file with your project so that everyone else sharing that project um, gets the same set of settings. Um, and you could also uh, have this ability to lock the settings at the flag argument level too. So if you do dash dash upgrade dot latest true, it means anyone who downloads that repo and runs Yarn upgrade will run it as if they were passing the latest flag. So that could be useful um, for some of you. Step five, Yarn is particularly smart about running scripts. As in, it'll guess, it'll guess the command um, for a script if it's not one of Yarn's predefined commands. So you could just skip out on typing out run. You could just say Yarn and then the name of the script. It'll even go further in saving your keystrokes by passing the arguments directly. Um, you don't have to do the annoying dash dash thing. Um, the only limitation I see with this approach is that you can't pass in different arguments if you were running a script that had two commands, but that's more of an edge case. Um, you could also access your user's environment variables um, at the script runtime by typing in yarn env. And I wanted to add two more things, uh, which aren't unique to Yarn, but we find pretty useful at our company. Uh, one is script hooks. So both NPM and Yarn will run scripts prefixed with the pre before the script and post after the script. So for example, if you're running Yarn build, it'll run Yarn pre-build before you run that command. And then it'll run Yarn post-build afterwards. 
The second utility we found pretty useful is the npm run all package, um, which is a third party library, and it lets you run commands in parallel or, a com or in a combination of parallel and sequen sequential ones. Um, and this one, I'm hoping maybe we could build this natively into Yarn someday. Um, so next step is integrating your package manager with uh, your CI server, CI server like Circle, Travis, or Jenkins. The nice thing is that Yarn comes pre-installed in a lot of these open source CI tools. And um, one thing to note is that by the time you get to this point, a change in package resolution and by extension your lock file is probably not intentional. I maybe someone changed package.json but forgot to update the lock file. To catch something like that, the frozen lock file flag will um, hard fail your build. Um, and if you want to use the lock file as the only source of truth, then you could also use the pure lock file flag, but this one won't fail your build. So um, even if the two files are out of sync, so use this one carefully. Um, another issue that comes up pretty frequently is that with CI servers, you may not always have the cache available because where you're running Yarn might be different from where the cache is stored, or sometimes you just run installs once and only once. So there's no reason to use the cache. This is where the offline mirror feature becomes useful. You basically set up a cache directory using the yarn config command or the yarn RC. And then the next time you run install, yarn will download all of the packages as tarballs into that directory, uh, which is smaller in size than your normal yarn cache. And then you check them into your source control tool. And then next time you download that repo, you also get um, your, your directory filled with all of the tarballs. So, your CI server will refer to these tarballs as a source of cache when um, you run Yarn next time. So um, you get all of these things for free um, by using Yarn. And this also means that now you could run Yarn offline on your CI servers, which, unlike us, don't need it, the internet 24-7. So we got this far without upgrading any dependencies. But again, we're talking about JavaScripts, right? So we're ready for fresh goodies. Um, this was a change made with the new 1.0 release. But Yarn by default won't change the version or range in your package.json unless you run it with the latest flag for safety reasons. Um, Another cool feature that I recently discovered is that you could actually pass in the pattern flag, which will match your um, glob or wildcard pattern to the, tool, um, to the keyword that you type. So for example, if you wanted to upgrade all of your Babel plugins at once, um, you could do so by passing the Babel uh, wildcard um, pattern flag. Another neat feature is Yarn Upgrade Interactive which shows you a command line UI to see all of your outdated packages and upgrade them at the same time for all you visual learners out there. Um, this concept has actually been taken from a previous third party package called npm check, but then was integrated into Yarn's core code thanks to another open source contributor. So now it ships with Yarn. And a quick plug, I'm all for usability, also a visual learner myself, so I do have an open PR based on an RFC to separate out direct and transitive dependencies when you upgrade them so you know which ones are actually your direct dependencies versus all of the, the list of all of the transitive dependencies that come with it. So getting pretty close. Um, so given how fast things change, um, version debugging can sometimes be hard. Thankfully, Yarn provides some helpful commands, like Yarn Check, which will tell you if anything is out of sync, and Yarn Y, which tells you why you have a particular dependency installed. Again, all of this comes from real experiences. Um, at Eventbrite, we ran into a problem of, why do we have this dependency X? It's not even listed on my list of packages. Um, Welcome to the world of dependencies. It's an incep where inception of dependencies or dependencies of your dependencies become yours. And then, um, and then yeah, that's your package. So the, feature, uh, so the previous alternatives would have been to A, stop using that library um, that's importing the bat dependency, or B, open an issue with that library, yell at the maintainers, or pray, do a rain dance, whatever, and hope that they upgrade their dependencies to a patched version. 
Well, now you no longer need to do that. Selective resolutions is a feature that I've worked on and we'll be using also at Eventbrite now that we upgraded to the latest version of Yarn. Um, how it works is that you define a resolutions field where the left side of the field is a glob pattern you want to match and the right side of the version um, what you want these nested dependencies to resolve it to. So this explicitly overrides all of um, the matched nested dependencies and therefore might break packages, but the difference is now that the control is in your hands. So the final feature that I want to talk about is uh, workspaces. It's probably one of the biggest features that shipped with the 1.0 release of Yarn. And it's useful for managing all of the dependencies across multiple packages in a mono repo uh, like Jest. The idea is that you have a root package.json with private field set to true and a workspaces field defining an array of subfolders to match. The individual folders themselves have only a package.json without a lock file because that's stored at the root level where the dependencies are resolved, hoisted, and linked um, between the packages. And for a very complex project, this feature could be a very handy tool to manage all your dependencies in one centralized place and avoid any unnecessary duplicate dependencies. Um, and as an added convenience, you also have the workspace command, which allows you to run scripts from the root parent directory um, um, for this individual scripts that you have in the individual project folders. So that's it. Um, thanks for listening. I want to end the talk by saying that the benefit of a package manager like Yarn is that it should do more than install your dependencies. It should be intuitive, easy to use, and it should help us build faster and identify um, issues faster and basically be a high-end product for developers. Um, I'm excited to see how this place uh, how the space will grow over time, and would love to talk to you about it. Also, I'm a pretty terrible millennial myself, and just made Twitter uh, a few days ago, but I'd love to hear from you if you want to keep in touch. And that's it. <laughs>